This one right here, I've already done the design. This is next. This is my last day on this one. There's still a lot of details I need to do on this one. So I'll be doing those kind of in my spare time, you know, like after breakfast and stuff like that. You know, between, you know, when I'm relaxing, you know, maybe I'll just come in for a few minutes and touch up on that. But what I'm going to be doing is stretching this camera uh, ca canvas probably on Saturday. Is I'm going to stretch this canvas. Then I'm going to put this one right by, the, right in front. I'm going to get rid of the Tupac one because it's too big. The one's, it's going to be a big one. I'm going to put this one aside. You won't be able to see the Obama painting in the background. And I'm going to start on this design. So I've already designed this. As you can see, I've already done preliminary sketches and everything. Sometimes I will kind of take this to a lab or um, a printing lab and print it out and get it shipped back. But right now, I'm going to be locked down for the rest of 2020. <laughs> This is, you know, I have a little little business, a little side business, but I can't do anything because it's, you know, it's, it's uh, COVID-19 out there. How's it going, Tyreen AC and Eric? So I'm just going off of my, I put, I spent my emergency funds on paint, canvas. I have all this canvas over here. I mean, I can show you all the canvas that I have. I have all this canvas. I'm going to stress this. This is only some of the canvas I have. So these are the, 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 the one of Africa. I'm going to call it African Vista. Actually, I would like you to give me an authentic name from your language, the Debele language, because that language also comes out of the Zulu Swazi language group. And it's one of the older language groups. I think you got clicks in it. I think you got the clicks in it. I don't know. Maybe not. But I want you to name that painting when I do it, uh, Mabo. Eric uh, Harold, so uh, yes, please, by all means, uh, yeah, in, in, yeah, in, in my top, in my top post, yes. You in my top post now? Take some pictures with your phone and please send them to me um, because I can say I could use that to kind of start coming up with designs. Now, I'm, I'm sorry, I let, uh, told myself like I'm working on this uh, picture here to just whatever little facial hair. This took me about six weeks to grow this much. <laughs> because I have like some Native American blood in me. Facial hair don't grow really easily on me at all. So I usually stay clean shaven, but however, you know, cause I only have to shave like once a month or, you know, once every other three weeks or something. So yeah, um, so uh, you only start moving around after April. So I'm thinking the way things is going in the US, I'm not gonna start moving around to August or September. <laughs> I mean, uh, you'll start calling the rag muffin then. <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's right okay so anyway let me go on to uh let me go on to 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 doing my thing here so what i'm going to do i don't know if you know this uh mabo but uh when i'm painting i gotta wear glasses because you know I, my eyes are not 25 years old like they used to be where i could just see forever all day really sharp and crisp and so I have to wear these now so I can see my little close details and stuff in the paint. So I don't know if I look smarter, dumber, uglier, you know, more handsome. I don't know, but there it is. I have my glasses on. So I have my palette made. I have my medium mixed and I have my brushes all ready to go. So basically what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to start on these. I'm going to really, really do redo the sky because even though the sky looks on this camera, to be finished, it's really just a quick gestural thing I did just to get the basic idea up. And uh, so I'm gonna repaint the sky and I'm gonna also kind of hit all these pyramids to make sure my paint is really, really thick and professional. I'm gonna hit that sail and that. I might gonna hit the raw Pyrenees Falcon and then I'm gonna hit the Sphinx. Then I'm gonna come down and work on her crown because there's gonna be ox going around as her halo. Each one of these little peaks coming out of her head is kind of like her energy that comes out of her aura, ori, or comes out of her ka, or her ba, and or her higher self, and it just radiates as this halo. I don't want to give her like a Christian halo. I'm giving her an African onk halo, <laughs> okay? And then what I do is I come down, I work on this collar. I work on her scepters of power. I mean, I work on the flame that's coming out of her hands because... She has the ability to make meta, metaphysical things happen so she can work with the elements, the elementals, 
can literally come forth out of her hand. So we have that there. And of course, all these different little small little pieces of uh, paintings. These could almost be paintings into their own selves. I'm going to just sharpen all that up. Then I get back on the Luxor temple. This is in Luxor, Egypt, which is Africa. Okay, this is the Luxor temple. So this is the location on the Happy River. That's what it was. The original name that the Africans named it in antiquity was the Happy River. Of course, today we call it the Nile River. And uh, of course, I think the source of the white and blue Nile River is Mount Kilimanjaro, where my friend Mabo is from. And matter of fact, if you guys ask her, she'll teach you how to say hello and all that great stuff in her language. So for you, uh, how's it going, Thurston? So for you American people who want to learn at least how to say hello, uh, you should at least learn Swahili. I think Swahili is, uh, when you get educated, you used to learn Latin and you used to learn Greek. Now today, uh, you don't have to learn Latin or Greek. What they try to do is get you with a popular language like Spanish, or of course, we already speak English or you learn French. Well, those are European languages. What do you do if you're African of, or of African origin? The common language should be Swahili because a lot of people in Africa can kind of halfway understand that. And then the, the Greek, the old ancient language should be meta nature. But then also, you should pick a culture, whatever the one that you can find an actual native African person from a certain tribe or so from a certain uh, 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 bloodline to teach you their ancient language. If you can find a person that will sit down and teach you something, I think all Americans should at least be able to have some basic uh, phrases they can speak and a basic understanding of how to structure the languages work. Uh, just in case they wind up submerged in that language, they can actually learn it with some ease, you know, if they find themselves in Africa and they have to speak with the native people, at least they won't be just totally lost, you know? So I think that's something that we should do uh, as African people. We should start learning uh, in at least one African language, if not two or three, because there's so many different languages in Africa. So anyway, with that said, I'm going to go on to doing my work. And of course, if any of you guys want to join my live, just send me a DM and then I'll just basically give you an invite to the live, you know, just send me your smartphone, just send me a DM. How's it going, Toya, Maya? I don't know what I'm, I don't know what I'm doing to your name. I hope I'm not messing your name up. Tia Moya. Whatever it is, it sounds really cool. I wish you could, I wish some people could get in my live and just speak, man, because it's probably some cool accents and some cool getting together, you know? People from various uh, continents, countries, backgrounds, getting together, man. That's what it's all about. Anyway, I'm in my studio. Of course, we know the coronavirus is out. A lot of Americans are on quarantine. So I'm taking this as a positive thing because this forces me to stay in my studio. So I'm getting work done. So once this is over, these works are gonna to go to go around the United States in various galleries and art museums. And of course, I'm doing something on the revolution, the, the modern, what the modern African-Americans are doing. Of course, the stately African-American, Barack Obama, he's also a Kenyan from East Africa, Southeast Africa. So, but he's American. <laughs> And uh, I think I'm going to have a Michelle Obama, too, before it's all over with. And then African-American history. I'm going to do one on Lincoln Visit Richmond, Virginia, because I'm a Virginian. And I actually didn't know that he visited Richmond. He could have even visited some of my ancestors. And the people who were slaves that were freed love Lincoln because you see the actual drawings. It's contemporary to the time. And you see the reaction. It's not just one person, one artist that drew these pictures. It's a multiple artists, it's like five different versions of Lincoln visiting because it's a big deal. The war was just one. The Civil War was just one in the United States. Uh, these, all these Africans, there were probably more than half of the country at that time because what happened was it was so many African people in this country. It was more African people in this country than it was European people and Native American people. So what happened was the Lusitania, the Titanic, all these places, all these ships, when they kept bringing them in to New York and all these ports, they were they didn't let anybody from Africa come in. They only let African people come in. And the whole idea behind that was to balance the power, you know, because this is a democracy. 
So you have to have more whites voting. If you're going to allow the blacks to vote, you're going to have to have more. And that's why we had so many in the South. We had so many delegates and senators right after emancipation that was African. Uh, they had to bring a lot of Europeans in to balance the population and not let African people in. A lot of people are not aware of that, that that happened. That's a strategy that was planned by our government to balance all these blacks. You know, they knew they couldn't get rid of us because there was so many, because it was way more than everybody else. So what happened was from 1865 all the way up to now, today, uh, but, but really, uh, you can see it happening with immigrants coming from all over because they basically depleted Europe most of the Europeans say, oh, we got space now. We don't want to leave. This is our homeland, so we're going to stay. So once, you know, all of the poor Europeans came over here and was able to benefit off of the product of people who work for free, Africans who work for free, built this country, made this country great. Uh, cotton, you know, if you have free labor, you basically seize the whole world market on cotton. And guess what? I'm wearing cotton. Everybody on the planet Earth wears cotton. And guess what? The United States was producing almost 100% of the world's cotton. So that's how we became extremely wealthy. We also made Europe wealthy because the people who was dealing in cotton was from Europe. Their old banks, everything was European. So Europe also got rich. Then they went through their, their renaissance and they were making art. So now I'm doing my renaissance. This is my renaissance. I'm making art about us. And I definitely want to do Mabo. I definitely want to do the Debele people. I want you to give me some pictures. I want real pictures from you. I mean, pictures from your eye, from your view, your people, because I met you. You know, you're my good friend. And those pictures are going to be special. So those are the pictures that is going to be part of my vision of my African vista. And I might even call it just your region. I might even call it Africa. You can give me a better name because, see, I'm an African-American. All I know is Africa. <laughs> But it'd be nice if you could give it a real African name for me. But that one's coming. Uh, but I want to do the Lincoln picture first. I also want to do the picture of the Native Americans because I am part Native American to Mattapana. Um, the original people were not called Powhatan. They were called Tsinica Mocha. Don't believe me, look it up. Uh, all of that stuff is fake. <laughs> Pow means place, like powwow, place, place of gathering. Pow height means divine place. So Powell Height Town, that's English. Powell Height Town, Powhatan. <laughs> so there was no such a group of people called Powell Height Town or Powhatan. They were called Tassina Kamoka. Tassina Kamoka. That's what they call from DC, Washington DC, all the way to North Carolina, all the way out there to the Shenandoah Valley. That was their territory. And the person was not named Chief Powhatan. Nobody called themselves a chief. The king was called a Wessawarks. Where's the warrants? Where re war rents? That's what he was called. It means king. It means actually it means divine leader <laughs> or the ordained leader by Moshe Monuto. That was the name for the great spirit, the all overarching spirit of everything. It was called Moshe Monuto, which translates the best way to get it in one word in English is nature, everything that exists. Moshe Manuto. Okay, just to give you some, the original state, the old dominion is what Virginia is called. Okay, before it was called that, it was called Tassina Kamoka by the, by the natives. The natives were not called Powhatan, they were called Tassina Kamoka. Sub tribes, which I, the surviving tribes, there's only really two that really survived, but it's basically four or five that basically got themselves families that basically reunited the tribe and got it going again, the Chickahominy and the Pamunkey. And of course, I'm from the Mattapanai. What happened was in 1619, some African people came to Virginia, right up the York River in Jamestown. I am a descendant of those people, <laughs> literally. <laughs> and you would say, oh, they became slaves. Yeah, for a little while, but they ran away. And they joined the Native Americans. They joined the Mattapanai and the Pamunkey and the Chickahominy specifically, and they educated them because they had already been to Spain, they had already been to Mexico and other places as slaves, as well as from Africa, they could speak multiple languages. And what they did, including English, and what they did was they educated the Native Americans on how to avoid the cannon, how to avoid the gun, the fire stick was what they called it. 
and how to fight. And that's where guerrilla warfare was invented right here by the Tassinakamoka, by the Matapanai, the so-called power tan. There was no such a person called Pocahontas. I always tell people poca means what in Spanish or poquito in Spanish means little. Hauntas means what in Greek? It means wanton woman or B-I-C-T-H or whore. <laughs> so what Native American understood Latin and Greek, much less English? They didn't. Her name was Matoka. There's a county in Virginia named after her. So they know her real name because the Native American people know her real name. I know her real name. So her name was Matoka. Basically, that meant that she was the, her womb, her mother's womb, and her womb is anointed to produce the next king. And her father's name was not Powhatan. His, her father's name was Wohan Sinoka. Wohan Sinoka. That was his name. And the person she was betrothed to, her, his name was Opak Kan Kanak. Opak Kan Kanak. And what happened was Captain John Smith and others tricked him. Well, actually, it was the guy that came after John. And they tricked him. And they wound up killing him so that he could not, because he was the toughest, baddest dude there was. He was going to be the next king. Uh, the bloodline went through the woman. The bloodline did not go through the man with the Native Americans. It went through the woman. And so that's the only way they can ensure that that is the royal bloodline, because there was no DNA test back then. So to know that, you had to come out of the womb, and that is the bloodline. So the, and also you ensured you had the strongest, smartest guy. Because the king and the queen would select whoever would be the next king. If that would marry, that person would marry the daughter that they select out of their daughters, who is generally going to be the best daughter. Sometimes the, 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 they call it a shaman, but it wasn't a shaman. It's a guy that wears the bird on his head. <laughs> yes, a lot of Native Americans, it's bird clan or mobola. That's what it's called. And sometimes it's called uh, megisi. So... That's what it's called in that language. It basically, that was the name of a person who was a spiritual priest. And he was, a feather means something. So if a feather of a certain bird landed near you, there was a sign from heaven because it fall from the sky, literally, of something, you know? And, you know, it was like, uh, that's how Mashe Manuto communicated to the average person. Feathers and things like that would fall from the sky near them. The person would collect that. And that would be part of their attire they would wear that as part of their journey through life so just to give you like a heads up on some native american culture just going to give you that much but now i'm going to focus on ancient kemet or ancient egypt so what a lot of people call egypt stands for hijab pata house of the creator pata you know is one of the nectars or the so-called gods but there was no nectar nature actually the proper way to pronounce it nature means nature that's one of the reasons i like kemet because medu, nature, nature, the words of existence, the words of everything, words of nature, means the same thing as Mashe Manuto. So that's a very strange coincidence, I think, that these two completely isolated cultures would have a very, very similar philosophy on their spirituality. So that's why I like the meta nature. But one of the elements of nature, of nature, is pata, the creative powers of the universe. The creative powers, pata. So Hijat Pata is near Cairo. It's near the northern section of the place we call Egypt today, which back then was called Tameri, or it was called Kemet. And uh, when the foreign people came in to take over, basically the Persians in, the, in 650 BCE, and then after that, in 350, after uh, Alexander the Great killed Darius in 350 BC, he took over. And they became, they inserted themselves as king of kings and lord of lords from that point on. But they began to assimilate some of the culture and change things. They didn't go deep into Africa. What they did was they tr tr chased the Africans south down toward where my friend Mambo is from. Down through Sudan, down through Ethiopia, all the way into Kenya, all the way even around the areas of Lake Kilimanjaro. Where they said the nature happy dwells, which is the source of the Nile. That's why it's called happy, because that waterway, that whole system, is the element of earth that fed the whole earth. It's the navel, it's the umbilical cord to the whole earth that started civilization. You know? And civilization bloomed from there, just like a child. So if you even look at the Nile River, it goes up like the stem of a flower. And then when it goes out to the delta, it blooms out in multiple directions, just like a flower. So nature even gives you 
an image <laughs> of a symbol. <laughs> so if you are uh, from a satellite and you look down, you see this river winding all the way through Africa, all the way up to it gets through Egypt and then right at the Mediterranean, it just empties out, it blooms out, just like a, the bloom of, like this flower down here that I painted. So anyway, I'm gonna go back to my painting. That's enough blah, blah, blah. That's the next painting I'm gonna do. Then after that, I'm gonna do one. I'm gonna probably try to stick with the Kemet theme. I'm gonna do Raina as Mayat. And what I'm gonna do with that painting, I'm gonna paint while I, I, I blah, blah, blah. So I actually can do something more than just kind of lecturing, you know? Sometimes I'm lecturing more so than I'm painting. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing here. You know, I'm just in here doing something. Uh, yesterday I kind of painted on these columns a little bit. And today what I'm gonna do is just touch up a little couple of little areas where I feel like it, the paint needs to be touched up a smidge. And just kind of get that going. But anyway, um, and then sometimes I got so many things in my brain, I forget what I'm talking about. So it's like I'm multitasking big time. I used to be, I could, I can multitask pretty good. But you know, it's a lot of brain power when you're actually working on paintings. You, you don't think it is, but it's quite a bit actually. And uh, this paint from yesterday hasn't quite set up. So I don't even know why I'm working on it, but I just saw a couple of little touches I wanna do real quick that I'm gonna do right in here. Then I'm gonna leave it alone. And a lot of times when you do stuff, you can almost mess something up. I'm gonna get a nice, good, soft brush, sable brush, and then I'm gonna blend this into the existing part. There, that looks good. So that's just a little touch that I wanted to add to that little tone that I, I created yesterday on that column. Because I kind of toned my columns. For people who've seen this before, you can see that the columns is toned. So the first thing I'm going to do today, I use these apple boxes so I can get to the top of my painting. <clears throat> and the first thing I do usually is I go in. What I'm going to do is work on these columns. I really want the paint to be nice. I kind of want to work on the sky too, but truth be told, skies are easy. But this color looks like the, uh, where is that? Skies are kind of easy, you know? You see a lot of people doing these like forest paintings and you think, oh wow, that's so nice. But actually that's some easy painting, man. It looks impressive. <laughs> and I think that's why they do it on like TV and stuff like that because it looks impressive. However, at least for me, it's, it's, it's well, I think it's just fairly easy painting. Okay, so. I have, this brush is loaded up with the wrong color. It's loaded up with a sky color. So I'm gonna put this brush back. I'm gonna get this brush out. Actually, I want a nice, good, nice brush. That one's a cheaper brush. I think I'm gonna use this brush right here. Look at this one. And I'm gonna use this one. And I'm just gonna kinda hit this pyramid. Do I want something this big? I don't know what I want, really. All right, I'm going to go for this. I need to get some more brushes, too. A lot of times, you're always buying canvases, you're buying paint. There's always something to buy. And of course, you know, when you're doing what I do, there's a tendency to stay broke more than it is to make money, you know? You're making money, then you're spending money to keep making money. Then it comes, you know, and so you're getting by, you're getting by, and then it comes a virus, puts a monkey wrench in everything. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit this pyramid. And it looks like from where you guys are, this pyramid... It's already painted, and it is. What happens is, I want this to be a museum quality painting. And for it to be a museum quality painting, the paint, if a person is gonna put their head two feet away, you know, 24 inches, for the people who are into centimeters, they're gonna put their head 30 centimeters away <laughs> from your painting, they're going to see the quality of your paint, you know? How thick is the paint? How, what, are they good? Are they painterly or, uh, you know, a master? Is this a, the brush strokes of a person who's a master painter? Or is this kind of like some sloppy, lazy brush strokes here? You know, and I don't like that. I like my paint to look like there is impasto and texture with a patina on it. So, you know, the surface has to be seductive. 
you know, visually the surface has to be seductive. It really, uh, and, and you know, paints, I was telling people the other day, paints are made out of crushed rock and various elements of the earth. So paints, unlike photographs, well, the colors in them will last almost forever. And they tell you the paints, you know, how permanent they are. And some paints are made by mixing several chemicals together. Those paints might last 100 years or so, but they're not proven for anything past that. But if you're mixing like this blue right there, that is a lapis color. That's a lapis stone. And same thing with this darker blue. That's ultramarine blue. That's another stone. And what they do is crush it into a powder and then they put it into like a walnut oil or linseed oil and they make your, uh, you know, make your paints for you. And then they name it something like ultramarine blue or cobalt blue or cerulean blue or whatever color. And, um, okay, I need to add some more pigments to my palette because, like I said, I want the quality of that paint. It's a really flat surface. So... Whenever you paint a real flat surface, you have to be sure to make sure that it's some really good paint because I've been to art museums and I can't go anywhere because of the coronavirus. So I can't go to any art museums to observe any work of any masters. But uh, when you are going to an art museum to observe some master work, uh, you know, I like to make sure, okay, is my work on par? Is the paint quality that I'm painting on par with that of, say, for example, in my local town right now, it's uh, Edward, Edward Harper is there. He's an American painter who basically painted in the um, early 1900s. He basically went around all around the United States and maybe it was the late, the late 1890s and the early 1900s. And he basically went all around the United States to the various elite cultures, you know, beaches mostly and resort areas and Areas that was really, really uh, fancy, I guess, or, you know, where, where, you know, you're a certain class of people would be conjugating mostly, you know, leisure. Now, about right here, I think I'm going to start painting. I got a little bit of um, uh, cadmium red in this brush, and I'm mixing cadmium yellow, and I have just a little bit of medium in it, not a lot. And I always want this color to go on really, because I already have my base color down. My base color is not looking shabby. I mean, this color, I'm not putting this down because I got a shabby color here. I'm putting this down because I want my color, I want this painting to look like money. <laughs> you know, that's what I want this painting to look like. Whoever gets this painting is a money person. This painting is going to speak of, of status. It's going to speak of quality. It's going to speak of somebody who did it was a, a, you know, was a person that put a lot of quality into the work. This didn't just get, you know, done, you know, just randomly, not haphazardly, but this was done and meant to be from the very beginning to be a quality painting. And so that's very important. I think this brush might be a little too wide. I'm going to move it over here. And uh, use this kind of um, this dagger brush here. No, maybe not. Maybe a bigger dagger brush, or maybe this flat. Which one I want? Okay, I'm gonna get this one here. Okay, and I'm gonna blend these. I have that cadmium yellow with just a little bit of cadmium medium in. I'm just gonna blend that tone just to make it look like the sun is really hitting it right there. Then when it gets here, the sun is just, it's, you know, that, that evening sun when it's going down, when it gets really orange, it's yellow, orange, pink, and red. It's slapping on that sandstone. And it's creating this really wonderful tone. And, and now I'm painting this with this really soft brush. That allows me to do some really soft blending of the paint and so that patina is very nice right there I like that quality of paint right there that's really nice and I'm just gonna add a little bit more cabin yellow right here because I don't want the paint to be wimpy or wispy at any place in this I want the paint to be really really there you know that this paint lives here now I'm gonna paint over the top of this crown area 
So when this sets up, I'm gonna let this have 24 hours to set up. So that's why I say, this is my last official day, but it's not gonna be the last day I'm actually painting on this painting because the painting deserves to be painted on it until it's done. But what I like to do is I like to start other paintings because I've already made up in my mind that I'm going to paint, you know, 10 paintings in 2020. I've already made that up in my mind. And I'm the type of person, I don't know how many people actually know me, but I'm stubborn. Once I make my mind up, <laughs> it's going to happen, man. It's just, it ain't going to change a whole lot. It's not going to flop around from one thing to the next. You can almost set a watch, you know, you can basically, you can go to bank with that thing. I mean, this dude's going to do this, man. So, and uh, actually, to tell you the truth, I made a decree for the place that I'm at in my life. I want to do 10 paintings a year for the rest of my life. So I'll finish up my life. If I live okay, if I can still move when I get older. <laughs> I mean, that is a desire for people to have when they get older. They want to still be able to be somewhat competent, you know. But I have uncles in my family that live to be 90, you know. 90 plus, you know. And, some of the women in my family, they to be even older than that. <laughs> so, um, and I think the men are going to get to live because, you know, men kind of had some hazardous careers back in the day. They did some really rough things, you know. It's like my grandfather, my great uncles, they, well, my great uncle, I should say, he was involved in World War II. I mean, he had to go through all of the gas and all of the crazy stuff they had there. Still little be in his 90s, man. So, uh, you know, he survived that <laughs> and still was able to put in some more time. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to carry some of these tones in here because I'm going to work on the sky, but I'm basically cleaning my brush on the sky. So <laughs> that's how leisure the sky is. I can literally, I don't even care what I put up there because I'm going to blend it all anyway because that's how easy it is to paint. Okay, I'm going to go into some of this cadmium yellow. I got a lot of this cadmium red here. And I'm making kind of like this orange. And I'm really mixing the color right here on the canvas because when you start blending these two together, because I'm painting wet on top of dry, you know? The paint, the base color is dry. Some of that is slightly transparent that you can see through. It glows through. But then also what I'm painting is the cadmium yellow into the cadmium red which is wet on wet that makes a certain type of patina certain type of look in the paint style the paint quality so even though some people they paint photorealistic i don't want to paint this particular painting photorealistic i can i mean you know as a as a painter i have the confidence to say that i can paint whatever the heck i see <laughs> And I can paint it real photo. I can paint anybody's style. Photorealistic. I can do abstract. Basically, if it's in my brain, if I can think of it, if I can fix it in my brain, I can create that image. You know, even uh, I, you know, I did a lot of graphic arts, you know, but before I started picking up my fine arts again, I was a professional graphic artist. You know, and I did a lot of stuff that you might see in your grocery stores. Your packaging, I was the packaging designer. And uh, I don't do that anymore because it's boring. <laughs> and my left brain just was trapped in that 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 career. <laughs> so then I kind of start, you know, I I'm always I've always had a lot to do, you know, in my brain, you know. So I went more, I said, okay, you know what? I I was in school and I was doing this uh cinematography. I think I want to focus on that. So I start focusing on cinema. I got kind of out of I had one foot in the graphic design and one foot in the cinematography and then finally no feet in graphic design at all that much <laughs> and cinematography then you know some of the work is I'm gonna say not few and far between but they work you real hard I mean 16 hour days for like two months then you might and you make a lot of money but then you might go about three months you ain't got nothing coming through you know <laughs> So that gets to be kind of old fast, you know? And of course, what I want to do is I want to get something done. I want to be doing something. I want to be accomplishing something. So uh, I said, you know, I got to get to the to the drawing board here. I mean, there's a lot of stuff I can do. I picked up jewelry for a little while because I was doing that. I like doing that. And uh, finally, I got back to my fine arts like I'm doing now. 
I just got right back to it. And that is some nice sun hitting that pyramid right there. That color, if you see it up close, it looks just as good as it does from a distance. Now I'm gonna just back up from it because when I back up, I get to see what I'm doing. And now I like it, but it's too orange. And what I need is, and I want the yellow part to extend down. And I already have it wet, so it's really hard when you got it orange like that, especially using cadmium yellow. Then you want to basically lighten it back up. So what I'm going to do is put a little bit more medium into the cadmium yellow, and I'm going to just pull it down. And this is a really intense yellow. And what I might need to do is knock this intensity down by adding a little bit of titanium white to it. But for right now, what I want to do is just move some of this yellow down to about right here where I'm painting now, about right where her crown is going to overlap that shape. And just kind of make that a little bit lighter. I had it so smooth and so nice. I'm going to go back to this brush. And this is why I wear messed up clothes because I use my clothes to <laughs> wipe my brushes with. Because I'm usually, you know, I like to paint big like this. I was painting like 40 by 60 inches. I don't know what that is in centimeters, but I was painting really big. I think it's, uh, what is it in centimeters? I think it's uh, like 90 centimeters by 100 and something or another. You know, that size right there. <clears throat> you know? But, um... I decided, you know, um, I just need to get bigger. When I painted this painting, I painted this painting once before at 40 by 60 inches, and it just was begging to be bigger. The painting was just saying, I'm too crowded. <laughs> I'm too cluttered. I need to be painted again bigger. That's what the image said to me. And see, that's what I do when I'm painting. I'm having a dialogue with my images. And the images are kind of talking to me. So I'm going to back up again and see if that yellow is pulled down. Oh, yeah, that's nice. Now, I have a little bit of gloss from the medium in the paint. <clears throat> and what I'm going to do is not put any medium at all in and just hit it back and forth with my paintbrush to try to make it more satiny or more matte. Just not that really matte, but just a little bit less glossy. Let's put it that way. Because you never know how it's going to dry. You might <laughs> have it like uh, satiny. Then it dries, it looks really flat the next day. And sometimes you have it uh, kind of flat, you come back and it looks more glossy, <laughs> you know? So you have to be kind of like into your chemistry, you know? The chemistry is whatever medium, you know? So I'm using like 30% um, Galkit, uh, which is made by a company called Gamblin. It's made from like a different, like flowers or some different material than lin traditional linseed oil. But I'm also using Gamblin's linseed oil, refined linseed oil as well. Um, I'll use about 20% of that. And uh, then I use their replacement for turpentine, which is bio-friendly. It's not, it's, it's not with that messed up smell like turpentine. So I don't need ventilation. So therefore my microphone is clean. And it's not like, uh, you know, I don't have to have a ventilation, my ventilation system on. How's, how's it going, Badu? What's up? How you do? Good seeing you. Erica Badu, I like her music, by the way. Uh, Denise Cheatham, what's up? Robin, Robin, what's up? Okay, good, good that you guys can come by and check me out while I'm working on this. Um, okay, so now I got that little facet of that pyramid in. What I want to do is get the uh, shadow side of this pyramid looking just as good as this yellow side. And that side is a little bit more, <clears throat> that side is a little bit more purplish. And so I'm working with a lot of soft flat brushes today, as well as some sable, I mean, some um, bristle brushes as well. So what I'm gonna do with that color is I'm gonna mix a little bit of um, alizarin and a little bit of dioxidine purple on my palette because I don't have enough. So I'm gonna put some more in. And that purple. And I'm gonna mix with uh, raw umber. 
and um, and of course, of course there'll be some element of white in this as well. But the whole whole idea with this is to, and I have paint brushes in my pockets. I mean, I got everything sticking out and doing all kinds of stuff. But the whole idea is, is again to put finishing to the finishing patina on this pyramid. I really want this pyramid to look sculptured, even though I'm painting it. I want it to look sculptured. So in order to do that, you really want to put down a great quality of paint. And you can do that when you already have a base layer down like this. So what I'm going to do is get a little bit of my uh, medium. Just to start, get my brush so it's palatable. Get a little bit of alizarin, get a little bit of dioxinine purple. Just try it out. Oh, I just like that almost straight out, just like that. Loving it. So I'm going to mix some more of that. And I'm going to put it right in here. I want it nice and rich. Now, this has a little bit too much gloss in it. And already I know that I'm going to wind up using more of this so because I like it. So I'm going to put some more on my palette. Now, the thing about it is all I have is a 36 millimeter, I mean, milliliter tubes. I probably should have had a 150 milliliter tube. The big ones because I'm starting to like these colors. And I start to like to use them. You can mix colors by having this in your palette kit uh, that you can't do with just the traditional colors that you would usually get from Galka that a lot of artists just use. So I always make sure I have a lizarin and I have a, this doxidine, a type of purple like this doxidine purple, no matter what uh, paint system I use. But this is the Galka paint system, which right now I'm using the artist brand or the artist label uh, or the artist level. They don't really have a level called pro level. Some, like Winston Newton, they have a level called pro. They have another level called artist. And they have a, another level called student. Well, they're a British company. Well, Gamblin is an American company, but they have just a level called student, and then they have a level called artist. But their artist level is pro level. It's pro level paint. It's really good paint. Now, there is, uh, I think it's like Holland paint. There's some other paint out there that's really high, high end. I've used that paint before when the client was really paying me to paint something for him. <laughs> and, you know, this person was paying top dollar, so I was going to use the best stuff. <laughs> and um, I used that paint. Those paints were just like a, a dream to work with. So there is a difference in the paint. However, are they necessary? A lot of times what you wind up doing is thinning your paints down anyway. You wind up thinning your paints down anyway. You know, add a little bit of medium just so you, it's not like toothpaste. You know what else? You literally are mixing toothpaste <laughs> uh, on your canvas. You know, you, you can't even make the, you can't make the lines and the shapes the way you want. You got to get the, you want to get uh, the paint at least to like a milkshake quality in terms of thickness. And then sometimes like it's a uh, thick cream. Then other times it's kind of like a, uh, a syrupy soda quality. I mean, that's basically how you can think of it. And of course the syrupy soap, soapy soda quality kind of goes on. You can really wisp up some real easy, it's, cause it's almost like water. It's not as runny as water, but it's very close. You can just throw your paint all over the place. The paint just whips and moves all the kind of ways you can. You just whip your arms and your brush around, create some really interesting brush strokes, really painterly, what, I, what other artists call painterly brush strokes. And, uh, and that's nice if you're a gestural painter. But uh, <clears throat> if, you're, uh, uh, if you're really a, uh, a photorealistic painter, you really don't work with a lot of patina. You really don't work with a lot of impasto. Your, your paint is very flat most of the time. And because you almost it almost looks like, you know, it was produced on a, some type of modern day high-end photo printer. You know, they have these things called G-clay printers now. They're basically printing latex. It's a latex type of printing. Latex is very similar to acrylic. Okay, so what I'm doing is just hitting this with another coat right over top of that. And that coat is really dark. And I kind of like that I had some light in the other one. In other words, 
it just didn't seem as dark as that. Now, it could seem as dark because of the fact that I, um, <clears throat> cause of the fact that um, it's just put on and has quite a bit of medium in it. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit this with a little bit of cadmium red right in here. To kind of just put a little bit of light, you know, like the sun's not getting it all the way. And I might have to even get into some like orange. Basically cadmium red with a little bit of cadmium yellow in it. And just kind of just pick that up a little bit with this soft dagger brush here. Or angle brush, I should say, or dagger brush, yeah. And the dagger brush works out really nice for painting this because you can get some nice tight corners with it. And also the angle that I'm standing on, I'm still painting up in the air. So, and basically what I'm doing is just getting some cadmium red with a little bit of cadmium yellow and just breaking up that, that the harshness of the darkness of that. And I'm gonna stand around and see if it's breathing any light and it is, yeah, that's good. So what I'm gonna do is go in and do that some more because I like that effect. I'm gonna bring this lightness down some over here. And what I'm doing now is I am adding some texture, some br brush strokes in here, some patina to get this really, really nice, you know? I want it, I want to have, okay. And so now I'm gonna lighten it one last time in the middle. Not even one last time, I'm gonna hit it with a little bit more yellow and just kind of pick it up right there. That's it. Take it up to the peak a little bit more. There you go, and blend it with what I have in there. Then I'm gonna get down and check it out. Go to, the, go to the back, about 15, 20 feet away. And see what I got. Yeah, that's starting to look pretty good. I like that. Okay, what I wanna do is carry some more of this lighter tone that I'm blending into that Daxodone Purple and Lizard Crimson that I put over top of that color. I'm gonna carry some more of this tone closer to this top edge too, because I like it there too. I want mostly red in it, but it is limestone, so it's gonna have like that, it's like a brown tone, but all of this is just a version of brown, you know? Because brown has a lot of colors in it. Okay, and I'm gonna take this, and this dagger brush is really, really nice to get close to this peak. And I've already kind of moved my, <laughs> my pyramid doesn't look as straight as it was. But it's okay, I can paint that back. What I want to do is get this facet right first. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. Let me just hit this middle with a little bit more. Lighter tone. Just a little bit more. Pick it up some more. And that's some good paint that's over that now. So I just kind of want to let this set up because I just like it. Like that. Okay, so now it's it's a dark shadow and it's kind of flat, but it's model flat. It's not so flat. It has interest to the flatness, you know, because you don't want to just paint something flat. I mean, because that's what it's going to look like. If you want it to look mechanical, I guess you can paint it flat, really, really flat. But I found out that nothing is really flat. Everything is undulating. Light is swimming over things. It's just, you know, it's just moving. The sun is moving through the sky. Wind, clouds are moving in the sky. Nothing is really perfectly even. Even on days where it's just no clouds in the sky at all, some atmospheric is happening. Something is happening with architecture or something around it to make things look a little bit different. Okay, so that's nice. That's not a wispy, wimpy color, set of colors at all. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back with a bristle brush, a nice hard brush, and I wanna hit some of those tones that got a little bit walked off when I, I kinda of strayed a little bit with my brush. So what I'm gonna do is go in there and straighten some of that up. Just straighten that back up. A lot of times I would just take my looks, utility knife and fix that. But 
I have a pretty steady hand. And then sometimes when you're working organically, <clears throat> you know, and you paint your lines just that this way, it just looks more natural. It looks like it's actually supposed to look. As, we, as when you use a tool and it starts to look very, it looks precision, but like I say, in nature, it's precision, but it isn't precision. It's so much going on that it looks organic. It looks, it looks like uh, disturbed. It doesn't look mechanical, let's put it that way. Okay, that's good. Okay, I'm gonna just use a sable brush real quick. Just load that up with just some dry cadmium ye uh, yellow light and just blend this that I just did so that that doesn't look different than what I've done already. Okay, good. That's nice. I love that, those colors. Now, I mean, I don't love it. I mean, I love it for now, you know? As an artist, you like something one minute, the next day you might hate it. <laughs> you might literally hate it. Now, I'm going to work on this white looking pyramid in the back i mean this is a nice tone but again the way i painted that is kind of wimpy it's not as nice it doesn't have what i consider the uh museum quality finishing tone and when i'm at this stage of painting where i only have less than 24 hours of official painting left but of course it's not 24 hours you know i'm gonna paint maybe about a six hour session today so i have six hours of painting left I very rarely would want to, uh, I'm basically putting on final patina. It's really nice. I'm focusing on making the best surface quality to the paint that I can possibly put on the canvas. And uh, because, again, these paintings are going to outlive me. I mean, at some point in time, you know, the time marches on and the artist is no longer here. But guess what is here? This paintings is still here. And uh, you can't come back and paint it and say, well, I wish I were to paint that later. Or when you sell the painting, it's like I was saying once before, to someone and they purchase it, it's theirs now. You can't go to their house or their gallery or wherever they are displaying the, the painting at and say, oh, you know, by the way, let me hold on to the painting again. It's something else that I really need to paint on that that I wish I would have painted, but I didn't paint. But now that I see it displayed in your uh, facility, I want to paint it better because I, I see that you value this painting and I should have paid more of attention. So I rather just pay attention right from the jump street. Just pay attention right now. Do the job. There's only one way to do the job and that is the right way. You can always do something quick and easy that's easier on you. But I don't like to work that way. I mean, that's not the way I do things because, like I said, I'm always, I'm always thinking down the road, you know. Uh, <clears throat> when I say down the road, I'm not even talking about five years down the road, ten years down the road. I'm talking, I'm thinking a hundred years down the road. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm different than everybody else, I guess. But I'm thinking a lot down the road, you know? What is life gonna be like in America 100 years from now, you know? I mean, did the people who lived in the United States during the roaring 20s understand that we will have, uh, you know, iPhones now and FaceTime and, and, and Facebook and some of the stuff that we actually have, did they know that? Could they conceive that society would change? Uh, you know, probably not. They most likely thought everything would stay exactly the way it was when they were living forever. But I'm sure the Native Americans that was here <laughs> thought before the arrival of the European, everything was going to stay exactly the way it was the way it is when they were doing their thing forever and ever, amen, rock. <laughs> However, it did not. Other people had other intentions, things, people's minds changed. 
situations. I mean, this coronavirus, I don't think that life on planet Earth is going to be the same from this point on. I just don't think so. Because we know another pandemic is going to eventually come. And we're going to be ready because this man has never been more capable medically, scientifically, than he is right now. This is the first pandemic where we actually have some kind of tool to fight back with. It's, I'm not saying first pandemic, the first major pandemic where we actually had some kind of um, tools. I mean, when I say pandemic, I'm talking about a virus with no known cure. And that we have to basically work from scrap one to try to figure this thing out. We have never been more capable to deal with it. And with this many people, with, with, with populations being so sophisticated and industrious as they are today, we've never been in that position before. This is the first time that we've been basically at this level where a lot of countries, especially countries like the U.S., you can hear the way Trump saying he don't want to lose no money. Him and his buddies already got together and said, hey, man, we're going to lose a lot of money making all these spacesuits for the medical people so that they can stay away from this virus. That stuff, and you know, what Trump did, you know, he fired all of the medical people at the uh, State Department, you know, an executive branch <laughs> that worked for him. He fired all of all the people thinking they were just useless. I guess he was still mad at Obama, you know. Oh, these people are cinematic, sentimental towards Obama. Let's fire them. So then this pandemic hits, and we don't have anybody in office that's qualified to deal with it. <laughs> They're all working in the private sector doing something else where somebody else can make money with it. They're not looking out for the government. <laughs> and of course, they don't want to just go work on no nothing. You know, they're trying to warn people, but they don't even work there. And then, you know, with something like this, weeks make a difference. Weeks make you like Korea or it makes you like Italy. That's the difference. Are you going to be prepared like Korea was? Or are you going to just get in there and just, just wing it <laughs> like what we're doing now? Like what Italy did, and you can see it turned out to be just a hot mess over there. So, um, it seems like we're headed for a hot mess itself. So, are we more advanced than we used to be? I say we're going backwards as a country. Not forward, backwards. Big time backwards. Not a little bit backwards. I mean, we've gone all the way back. We passed the World War II status. We were smarter than World War II. We're dumber now as a country. America has been dumbed down. I mean, I knew it was a lot of GED people before World War II. I mean, there was a lot of people who probably couldn't read and write. They was over there fighting the Germans and whatnot, you know? But then after that, we made sure that the average American was pretty smart. And of course, what we got out of that was the hippie, hippies, you know? We got people that was too smart. So then it was a movement, I believe, amongst the elite that run us to Dumb down the universities. These people are way too smart now. They're protesting. They want stuff. They want world peace. They want, they want stuff. You know, they want cleaner environments. They want everything. And all we really want to do is clearly, we just want to make money. They don't want to give them nothing. Just go back to work and get sick and die. But we're going to sit up in our ivory tower and we're going to continue to make money. Because you know that class of people, they don't work. They never work for generations. None of Donald Trump's kids work. Donald Trump himself didn't work. His dad didn't work. His grandfather came, he ran a brothel in New York. Basically, a whorehouse. That's how they got their original wealth. <laughs> I mean, just FYI. He was a pimp. I mean, classic. And so that pimp money got him to where he is now, President of the United States. Only in America could something like that happen. That literally a pimp, the grandson of a pimp, who's also himself a kind of pimp, 
can become the president of the United States. It's amazing that we have a system set up where there's a certain group of people for generations that never have to work. They never have to send their children to war. What they do is they get in positions where they make decisions to send other people's children to war and to work. And they get comfortable with that. They feel like it's their natural place. They're a human being just like everybody else. But they feel like because they got into a certain monetary level financially, or their grandparents did, or their parents did, that they're entitled to this. It's entitlement. And that's the financial system we have today. <clears throat> and I say that financial system needs to be torn down. This is a good time to tear it down because the financial system is going to crash worldwide. I'm not talking about the United States. I'm talking about the whole planet. <laughs> because the Chinese ain't doing no better than us. It's just that they ain't telling nobody how jacked up they are. <laughs> That's the only difference between them and us. Is that we show with everybody exactly how jacked up it is. The same thing with Italy. They showing the world we messed up. Barcelona, I mean, not Barcelona, but uh, Spain too. Yeah, we messed up. We should have taken this serious, but guess what, everybody? We didn't. <laughs> We ain't taking that. And this is everybody now. I see people on the internet. Yeah, this is some kind of um, G5 or 5G. I don't know, man. What in the world has that got to do with, with a virus? They're two different things. <laughs> anyway, you know, it could be propaganda. Somebody don't want a new technology taken over. So they get on Google and they make some articles. They're coming from different locations. They hire somebody to, to put out their propaganda. And then people, everybody's Google search. Yeah, I researched it. I see these people, they be Googling me, search, and I researched it. But you, what do you do? You sat on your phone or your laptop and Google. Stop saying research. Research is when you actually search for something. You go to Kemet, you dig in the ground, you find something. So you search for it. Then you actually have an artifact that you can hold on to. And that is a actual art a uh, fact. It's a fact. It's a thing. It exists. <laughs> That's research. Googling is not research. <clears throat> Googling is just simply reading somebody else's information and taking it as fact. That's what you're doing when you Google. You're reading somebody else's information. And you're saying, this is a fact. That's not research. And then if you're going to do like some kind of research where you're using somebody else's information, because they do it all the time in academia. They take somebody else's information, but what they do is correlate it between three or four different sources that came up with this answer using completely different isolated methodology. They came up with the same, and the whole idea behind this kind of research is that the, 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 the chances that these various different intellectuals would come up with the same answer without really exchanging information amongst themselves usually would mean that whatever it is they came up with is probably the right answer. But it's not actual factual, it's only Multiple people thinking the same thing. You know, there's a lot of times just because a lot of people think that that don't make it true and don't make it a fact. You know, it's a lot of people who believe that the earth is flat right now, right here on social media, especially the Hebrew Israelites. You can always tell the Hebrew Israelite because they don't even have to say anything. All I got to do is say, do you believe that the earth is flat? They'll say, yes. I know I'm talking, especially if it's a black person. I know I'm talking to a Hebrew Israelite. <laughs> or if it's a white person, I know I'm talking to a KKK. A Christian evangelical. One or the other. They seem to all have the same exact MO. They, have, they believe the same stupid stuff. I said, how does a black Hebrew Israelite believe the same exact thing as my local? Because I got, you know, I'm from the South. I'm from Virginia. I'm from this, the rural area of Virginia, the jacked up area where... The original KKK 
where, the, where, the, where they made up the KKF. Some of the guys who, the fundamental uh, developers of the, <laughs> I think they were from Tennessee, but anyway, they got all their, they got backed up by these guys, man. You know, the stuff took hold here real strong. You know, I grew up with these guys. You know, I went to high school with some of their, their dads. I mean, guys, when I would come, I would come to high school. Here's my buddy. I'm, I'm actually always been an artist. I was in art class. Here's my buddy. I'm a really good artist, even in high school. And my buddy, oh, yeah, Steve, you're a really great artist. That's my, uh, you know, my legal name, Steve. But I like to be called Second Ra now. And, uh, but you know, let me show you, man. You know, you think I'm a, you're a really good friend. I said, yeah, I think you're a pretty good friend, man. You're all right. You're not like some of those others. But he said, well, look, you wrong, dude. Let me show you my KKK ID card. Just like the driver's license that you have in your wallet right now. Just as legitimate looking. This guy pulls out. This is back when I was a kid. So this is not, you know, this is, they've been legit for a long time. This ain't something that just happened, you know, since social media started. Social media started and these guys can meet online in one spot. They can start getting their meetings and conjugating and all of them get the guns and meet up in Charlottesville somewhere. You know? <laughs> they can actually start getting together, man. But they ain't just start. But I noticed that these uh, Hebrew Israelites and the Evangelical Christians and the KKK, their, their philosophies are very much lined up with each other. Because sometimes, you know, I get, you know, because I'm everywhere. I'm not just in the pro-black places. I'm in just normal political spots and I'm talking to somebody and they see, oh, this guy's hitting with some really big time information. Then they see I'm black, so they go, oh yeah, he seems, he's a black guy. He seemed to know something about, you know, he seemed to be smart. But this, this guy is a white supremacist. And he's testing me. He want to know how much I know, you know. Would I know how I feel about certain things. And he'd come in and, you know, and then we get to talking. And I don't even know that this is a white supremacist. I'm starting to suspect this is a white supremacist I'm talking to here. You know, because they'll say little things and it's, oh man, that's a racist joke right there. And then, uh, but then they're talking to me kind of friendly. So I'm thinking, okay, it's all, it might be all right, you know what I mean? Let me just keep going, you know, this might be okay dude, I mean, you know, it's something that we have in common. He seemed to be liking one or two of my comments and, you know, and, you know, of course I'm gonna show, probably show my artwork and, oh, you're a very good artist, so thank you. And uh, anyway, um, Turns out that this guy is a white supremacist. Or here this guy is a preacher somewhere in a local church somewhere. I'm like, oh my God, this, this guy sounds just like the KKK I just talked to. And then finally the guy said, I can't stand niggers. All niggers must die. Then he ends the conversation. <laughs> then I did the next thing you know, I'm talking to a Hebrew Israelite. To see, that's what I do. And, uh, Earth is flat. I mean, the same philosophy. They got to feel the same way about Trump, everything. And I'm like, okay, so this must be a white supremacist. And then come to find out, this guy comes in with the big old, I mean, the big old beard down to here. He got it all come, big old mustache. I'm Hebrew. They figure like they grow a beard, they're Hebrew. That's all you got to do to be a Hebrew is grow a doggone beard. <laughs> you are, and all of a sudden you transform your ethnicity or your yourself into a Hebrew. But everybody, all your cousins, they just regular old black folks, by African Americans. <laughs> all your first cousins on both sides, you your mom and daddy is like your mom married your mom married your dad's brother, you know? <laughs> so y'all double cousins. And on both sides, both of them, you know, uh none of them is Hebrew is like the only one is a Hebrew Israelite is you, and you grew a beard, and now all of a sudden you're a Hebrew Israelite. I always been a Hebrew Israelite. Well, if I'm your first cousin, and I'm not a Hebrew Israelite, I'm your first cousin. Ain't nobody ever told me we was a Hebrew Israelite before, 
And I was the one, you weren't the one talking to the grandparents. I was always the one up in the old folks' face before they died. I was the one that was writing down and recording them on camera and audio and writing the stuff down that they had to say. It was me, not you. But now you want to say you're a Hebrew Israelite. Anyway, here's the KK guy. The earth is flat. Donald Trump is the best thing since grits and gravy. Here's the white supremacist. You know, then here is the uh, white evangelical. Donald Trump is the best thing on the planet. And then here's the Hebrew Israelite. Donald Trump. Why are you always criticizing Donald Trump? And everything is Abrahamic religion. Everything. Nothing is from Africa. I said, how in the world are you going to have that? I mean, I look at my cousin's hair. His hair is nappier than mine. His nose wider than mine. I mean, I love my cousin. I ain't going to tell you I don't. I love him. He got the same last name I got. Big and thick, you looking straight up Mandingo, like you straight up from Nigeria almost, man. You got that kind of build to you. <laughs> man, you looking like some Kunta Kente and jump, man. Forget about Kunta uh, Chicken George, man. You looking like Kunta Kente up in here. And you trying to tell me that you a Hebrew Israelite. I mean, I'm just having some problems with that, you know, because if my cousin could do it so easy, and then his brother, though, now his older brother and younger brothers, because he got about four or five brothers, they not Hebrew Israelite. They just black folks. Well, I said, well, okay, well, what is what is Marcus? What is he? Well, he don't want be, he don't want to claim his birthright. So, okay, I see, I see what you're saying. Because I said, well, what is Montre? He don't want to claim his either. I go, oh my gosh, man. So, how about me? Do I want to claim mine? Well, do you? No, man. He said, yeah, I know, because you're wearing that arm. <laughs> I said, well, at least I know I'm not Egyptian. You know, I'm not from Egypt. I'm not an ancient person like that, but I like archaeology. I, I study it. But I don't claim to be an Egyptian. I don't tell people I am from Egypt from 5,000 years ago. I just don't do that. I just say, well, you know what? African place is a is a continent it's a landmass and i'm sure that africans had thousands, tens of thousands of years to walk all over africa if we could put it on ships and come all the way over to america surely they could just walk and migrate all over africa because it's a continual landmass there's no there's no real you know there's no there's no technology that you're going to need to travel from one geographic area to the next over time, you know? Sure, there's mountain ranges, there's deserts. But for the most part, you know, with just a little bit of ingenuity, and we humans, we have a lot of ingenuity. For the most part, you're going to be able to travel a little bit, you know, and get from place to place. I mean, like I was talking to my friend Mabo, you know, she said with well, her tribe, the Dabeli tribe, was originally in South Africa and when the white folks came the king was driven all the way from South Africa all the way to Zimbabwe and he was basically running for his life I mean she told me the story she's a very smart she's an educated girl she's a very smart girl very intelligent extremely intelligent girl very very uh reach I mean her rationale her ability to process information very high so I have no reason to to doubt her information and then I research I research her because she should know her own tribe her own history I researched behind her and saw that the information was very correct this tribe actually moved from the South Africa area chased by the the colonized the European people it was basically invading the area and the whole idea was they was going to kill this king period they weren't going to stop chasing this guy till he was dead because he had a right to the territory a birthright that goes back thousands and thousands of years a claim and of course when you have an occupying group 
They don't want you to have a claim to that. They got the claim. They want to make sure that none of your seed, none of your people are going to ever. So if you were a Hebrew Israelite, I'm going back to that. I'm sure if you was of a royal, any kind of a special bloodline, somebody would have made sure they passed on to their children. Look, this is who you are. Because the Belly tribe, this is like three, about two, three hundred years ago, I guess, somewhere in that neighborhood, maybe 150 years ago, uh, at the most, I think. Um, but somewhere in that range, they know who they are. They know where they originally came from. Okay, well, they didn't go through slavery. They went through colonialism, you know? So what I'm saying is, uh, <clears throat> what I'm saying is, uh, you would pick, you would kind of keep something, you know, you won't keep everything. And, you know, make your clouds, I uh, just want some little puffy hits in here. See how easy it is to make clouds? It's kind of fun, you know? And essentially, what I'm doing is cleaning my brush. And just wherever my brush hits, that's how the cloud's gonna puff. That's why it's, it's so much fun to make clouds. Let me get some of this titanium red, it's real bright. I really was trying to clean the brush, now I just added red, which is a hard color to get rid of. Okay? <clears throat> and then what I'm doing is I'm working this way. I'm kind of working this way. I'm going left to right here. I mean, going right to left backwards. Because I'm left handed, I guess that's what I should do, huh? <clears throat> But um, now, this, this going back also to this KKK guy, he was a friend of mine. Matter of fact, he was such a good friend of mine, he would come over after school and eat lunch with us and eat dinner, watch cartoons. You know, the little cartoon network came on after school. You know, he was a KKK though. His dad was a KKK. Now his dad almost never socialized with us. You know, I'm reminded of that, that, that movie, uh, I'm telling on myself with this movie, uh, Monsters Ball that had um, Holly Berry in it. How um, the little black kids was playing with the white kids, but the white parents didn't want, <clears throat> didn't want the black, the white kids, their younger kids playing. That's some real down south stuff right there. That stuff happened all the time. <clears throat> The people who ever wrote that knew exactly, they must have been from the South because they definitely knew exactly how that stuff worked. Because that's exactly how it was. I mean, you'd be around somebody, their parents literally hate your guts. But this guy is almost like your good friend. He's like, he's a good friend of yours. I mean, you guys would be playing together and doing all kinds of stuff and, you know, and sharing with each other and laughing together. Basically having a good time, a good old time. But then their parents literally hate your guts. They, if they could find you somewhere by yourself and they didn't, even if they knew that you was a friend of their kids, they might string you up in a tree. That's how it used to be. We're not talking that far ago. We're talking 1970, late middle 1970s. This was still going down back in, in certain areas of the South. This kind of thing was still going down, man. And uh, now if you're up in like Detroit, New York City, somewhere like that, you're oblivious to this. You, ain't none of this happening. You might be getting something different happening. They, you got slighted on your paycheck or something, you know, or the boss, you know, somebody said something to you, or they verbally said something to you. That stuff is laughable. Ain't nobody care about what you're saying. They care about, like down here, they care about if you actually go to your guns and you show up with some torches in the yard, a burning cross. And then it was about, okay, can we survive this thing? <laughs> you know, as opposed to, uh, you know, I'm gonna call the authorities. One of the authorities coming. If it was, they're gonna be friends of the people that's trying to, Kill you. <laughs> so you had to be smart, you had to be resourceful, and you had to kind of be a couple of steps ahead all the time. Or else you might not even be on the earth anymore, breathing anyway. You'd be on the earth, but six foot under. But anyway, uh, 
going back to, uh, you know, I can't tell the difference between a Hebrew Israelite sometimes and these white supremacists. You know, they just, they hate Barack Obama. I mean, there's a lot of so-called conscious people. Man, the guy ain't even president no more. Yeah, he killed Gaddafi. I didn't, he, well, on his watch, Gaddafi got jacked. I didn't like that. He didn't look out for Gaddafi at all. You know, not that it was probably on his mind. And the country I was telling before, people before, the country is not one guy. The country, this country is a bureaucracy. It's multiple people. Many, many heads, tens of thousands of people. It's not one king doing everything. Yes, a king can hire a cabinet. That cabinet could, but you don't know what secret agendas that cabinet member has. You don't. You don't know who else he was talking to long before he met you. And now he's found favor with you and you put him in position. And now he's going to use you to, to, to fulfill some other political uh, objective. You don't know that. All you know that it's a black dude <laughs> who's there and another brown melanated dude got jacked. Thus is his fault. But that's a really elementary school way of looking at the thing. It's real not it's not a smart way to look at things because I ran a company before and uh, I had like a secretaries and stuff like that and had, you know, like about seven employees. And it got to the point, it was so complicated to run my company. I couldn't function with about certain administrators. You know, it was this young lady named Roberta. There's another girl named Suzanne. Without them, my company would have crashed and burned, man, because it got so big I could not. When I first started, it was just me kind of, and well, I could do everything I wanted to do because it's a little small kind of, little kind of small, some, some mom and pop style thing, you know? But when it started taking on like a, a future, it started getting big, the money got dynamic. The money was coming in so fast, I couldn't even count it all. I had to hire an accountant just to count the money. That's how fast the money, and then even then it was hard to keep up with it. I just had to trust the accountant that he was doing the right thing. I had to make sure, okay, the only way I can trust that nobody's misappropriating my funds, nobody's doing this, is I got to make sure I hire somebody who's honest. That was the, my only real defense to make sure nobody was stealing to, to my, my financial people. People weren't stealing my finances. That's how it is. And I only had seven employees. Could you imagine if you had 70,000, 100,000 employees? Military people, very capable. <clears throat> uh, political uh, adversaries, as well as political uh, people that's on your, so called on your side. It's very difficult. I would just tell you that being the president of the United States, especially one that actually does something and wants to administrate it right, like Barack Obama, not the way this coronavirus was handled. <laughs> like, I'm gonna just name the name, Donald Trump. I blame him for everybody who dies. <clears throat> and the reason I do is because he fired everybody <laughs> that would be normally working on pandemics, just like his no global warming problem. He, he left in front of the whole planet it's just ironic that this was happening. From the whole plan, he says, I'm not going to be part of all this fake global warming junk. Wow, it really seems all these departments now seem fake that you got rid of. And now the very people that he basically insulted, he needs to save the country right now. That's the irony of this thing. The very scientists that he insulted to say their science ain't science, it's some quack junk. The Bible is real and scientists are fake. Is the very same people he need to get himself out this corona problem right now. I mean, this nature has a way of humbling a, the toughest ego. Just humble that thing right on down, <laughs> you know? I mean, he can be as smart as he wants to. I mean, because like I said, don't take nothing on an apprentice show to see somebody else who's smart and say, oh, yeah, you, you, you could have done this better. Look at the armchair quarterback looking over somebody's shoulder. Oh, yeah, you did a good job right there. 
I mean, you ain't got to be smart. All you got to do is be some rich guy who's a predator. You know, he's a financial predator. And he uses his money to exploit people a lot smarter than him because they don't have any money. <laughs> and he needs them more than they need him, actually. But they don't let you know that because they make you think you need money. Because everybody want to get it now because, you know, there's a lot of people out there competing. And they might know somebody who's rich who give them the money. And they'll get to the market before you get there and corner the market. Then all your, all your bright ideas is now exposed and now gone. Just as fast as it came, it's gone. I understand that, you know. I understand how that works. And there's a lot of pressure if you're an inventor now. And it used to be departments we had. We used to have that protect people. Now everybody's stealing uh, technical licenses and technical uh, property as well as like what I do, creative property, left and right. It's just uh, in the digital age, it's just so easy to do that now. <clears throat> but if you don't create any kind of bureaucratic system, I mean, that's what a bureaucracy does. It seems like it's wasting money most of the time. You know, why are we spending all this money with this agency for viruses and stuff like that when we have never even had a problem in this country? That stuff happens elsewhere. And then so you fire everybody. <clears throat> and then because you, you don't have a crystal ball, you don't know what the future is, but wise people are prepared for a lot of things. So you have to have a bureaucracy to run a country. You don't need it to run a company or to even run a household because those are small little things. But once your stuff gets big, like a country, and you have 760 million people. All of a sudden, you do need a lot of help. There is some waste involved. And the reason the waste is involved is because you don't know, you got a lot of, you're juggling a lot of balls in the air, and you don't know which one of those things gonna hit the ground and burst, because they're glass balls, they're delicate. You don't want any of them to hit the ground and burst, so you gotta be, you gotta have systems in place. You're a trapeze walker, and you need to, you gotta pay money for that net, you know? Another guy would say, that the net costs too much money. We don't need that. Forget that, I'm just gonna walk this trapeze. I'm a really good trapeze walker. Then he just happens to slip, you know, a bird sits on it and poops. He steps on it and he slips and falls to his death. Well, he'd anticipate the little, silly little, bats in China, <laughs> getting abused by the poor little Chinese worker barely trying to make a living, selling bats to people to eat. I don't know why they're doing that, but that's what they're doing. But, uh, and of course they're in squalor position, the bats are suffering and the immune system go down and there's bad hygiene amongst the workers and bad hygiene amongst the bats. And it takes a normal coronavirus as normal virus and it mutates it into a, a very lethal entity, a new virus, then that virus wreaks havoc on the planet. Why? Because China is trying to advance itself and catch up the United States to such a level that they're not even making sure that they have systems in place to protect their citizens. And now, shucks, we have a global daggone thing now. Because <laughs> this thing has gotten in people's backyards now. It's not in China. It's up in my studio. It's not in my studio, but it can. I'm locked in my own studio for some for some stupid stuff they're doing in china you know why in the world am i suffering from some dumb junk that happened in china we need a global system that can address this stuff so chinese people american people I, you know because billionaires just want to make money i mean you can't blame them they just are predators they're the lion everybody else is a gazelle they eat us for a living. That's their job. Else they wouldn't be a lion. They'll be something else. Okay? That's how they were born to be. Or they were trained to be that way, you know? Whatever the case is, that's who they are. You know, you're not going to get like a Carl Lewis or Usain Bolt, Olympic runner, to sit there and just kind of, you know, you know, not use their, you know, they're born. They're not going to just get out there and just tiptoe through the tulips. 
when that guy shoot that gun off, that dude is going to blast out of there because he can. He can do it just like nobody else can. He's just really good at it. He knows it. He's going to get out there and say, time me. And he's going to show the bump up. <laughs> he's going to get off and he's going to blow some people's minds away with his ability. Because he knows he can do that. You know, that's, <laughs> that's his skill. That's his thing. And that's what people do. But so you can't let these people wreak havoc on your planet. You can't let them wreak havoc on society. So you have to put together some type of system where normal people that don't have those kind of abilities, you know, with billions of dollars and major corporations, normal people that don't have these kind of abilities can still go out and play tennis in a local park with somebody. Or they can go to the museum and see, hey, I want to go see the, the Edward uh, Harper show again, see some of his work again. And they can go and see some of my work in the local galleries. Because some of my work is finished, now people can go and support me and say, oh, wow, man, that's some really good work. But now I can't do that until 2021 because some idiots got rid of the departments that would normally be getting us up to date. Because, I mean, I'm gonna give you the exact solution to this corona thing. For everybody who, this don't take no rocket scientist to be able to figure this out. I just figured it out. I'm gonna tell you exactly how to deal with this thing. It don't even require any money. The problem is they don't wanna spend the money. <clears throat> All you have to do is get a test and make a site just like Facebook that you can log into Send this test to my house, coronavirus test, to every American or every citizen on the planet who wants one. Issue a decree that everybody must self-quarantine. It's illegal to leave the house. We're going to send rations. You're going to order your food. And we're going to have a special program set up, a special group of people to send your food, to send your stuff to your house. But it's going to, you're going to get a ticket. You're going to get, matter of fact, we're going to put you in quarantine. If we have, if you can't self-quarantine yourself, that way nobody can get infected. So now what you do is you're in your house, you self-quarantine, and you take the test that comes out that you are negative. In other words, you don't have coronavirus. You still can't go out. You have to stay in. But then neighborhood by neighborhood, block by block, community by community, you check those people off. Now when somebody sends in their kit, and they don't know it, but they come up, instead of them driving all around to the local car wash, to the local, uh, you know, uh, movie rental store, or <laughs> the local McDonald's and infecting everybody, you get that person into an isolated quarantine. You pick them up because their test came out positive for coronavirus. So you go get that person because why? Do you have to get that person because they can infect others for their own safety they can get care and treatment and for the safety of others so they won't get it from you you just got an ignorant dummy off the street <clears throat> okay so that's basically what happened you got the dumb dumb off the street that, that that's not doing it but you can't say that this person's a dumb dumb because he don't have those resources he's not a scientist he doesn't know He's just doing whatever he used to do before. So this leadership has to come from the top. That's why I say it's Donald Trump's fault because it don't take no scientists to know how to do this. I mean, just some common sense. It's common sense. Okay, so once you get the test going at everybody's house, what you do then is say, okay, this test is going to everybody's house. Now, this region, for example, this little small county has two, 3,000 people. I'm not saying that's what my county has. Let's just suppose your county has 10,000 people. Okay, this county is clean. No, we got three people from this county that got it. Go get them. They test it. Okay, now you check them off zip code by zip code. Address. We have the postal system has this information. Everybody, now the guy living under the bridge, no. Don't nobody know where he lives at. But then you send the police out to find the dude under the bridge. You haul him in, you get him tested too. <clears throat> So now the hobo living on the street, he's tested. Everybody's getting tested systematically. What you're doing now, you don't have a cure to the, to the virus. That's just, 
Let's get this clear, because somebody came to me and said, we got, there's a clear to, there's a cure to it, they're just not using it. That's some bull crap. Don't nobody want to die. This thing could kill a billionaire, it could kill a, a, a senator or a president, just as easy, a white person, a black person, blue, green, yellow, orange, whatever, just as easy as it can kill anybody else that's already died from it. So let's get that straight once and for all. If I hear that again, I think I'm gonna go crazy. People say, oh yeah, there's a cure. They just don't want us to have it. Again, I'm gonna go to say, what do they get out of killing somebody from the hood with no money? Nothing. <laughs> They're spending all this money to shut down the whole economy of the country, losing not billions, hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars, just to get rid of you that ain't making a nickel for nobody. Not even yourself. As a matter of fact, you're getting welfare right now. You're getting some kind of government assistance right at this moment, you know? So, come on, man. Okay, you got a job. You work at Walmart. You're working at FedEx somewhere. Wherever you're working at, you ain't no big priority on nobody's list for them to go after and knock you out. Matter of fact, everybody knows that the more people you have to tax, the stronger the country is. The less people you have in your country to tax, in other words, people who have jobs make your country strong because you can tax them. People who don't have jobs make your country weak because they are basically benefiting over everybody else's work. That's a fact. That's why people, certain people like everybody to work because they know the people who work are the ones that make this, that pay for all of the bills. Every smart bomb they knock on, down, drop in the Middle East, American taxpayer bought that. <laughs> and they can make decisions now on who get to get bombed. American citizens don't even, don't make any decisions on that. They don't even know that that's what's happening with their, their money. Matter of fact, they think peace on earth, goodwill to men, all at the same time. They just pay taxes and boom, that smart bomb just killed the village off. <laughs> you know, they're oblivious. So what I'm saying is, um, uh, <clears throat> they don't care about, you know, Buster from the hood, man. Ain't nobody trying to kill you off, man. Because you're not powerful. You're not, you're not gonna, you're not gonna make a difference on the planet if you living or dead. They might kill somebody like Gaddafi. He does make a difference. He's got power. If you got power, then you want you're the one they after. If you got some resources in your country. You're the one they're after. If you ain't got Jack, man, you know, don't nobody even care. They don't even want to waste the time to go kill you. Because if they lose money just coming after you. <laughs> now, they want to keep certain people out the country because, you know, it's a democracy, so you keep power. If you don't, because otherwise, Mexico is going to be making all your laws soon. I mean, I'm not saying that anything against Mexico, but... If half of Mexico, and people, they don't even say that they're American. They say, I'm Mexican. <laughs> half of Mexico is in your country. They ain't going to let Mexico go down, man. That's, they, they love Mexico. They're going to let U.S. go down. If the chips hit down, there's a problem between Mexico and uh, the United States. They on the side of Mexico. It was always funny in the Olympics. You see these guys, and they say, well, I'm an American. But I'm going to go back home and be on the side of my, my home country. Hold on, man. You was born here. <laughs> yeah, your mom and daddy was from there. You trained here. You learned everything about your skill here. But now you're going to take it back to another country and, and represent them in the Olympics. I always thought that was like weird that that would happen in certain countries like America. But at the same time, I mean, we didn't care because we had a lot of people who Hey, that guy just made room for another American to get in the Olympics. Because he was really good anyway. Now, the American guy get to compete against him. That otherwise wouldn't have got a chance to get in there. What I'm saying is he's a long-standing American. All of them Americans, but just puts another person in the Olympics that wouldn't be here. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, getting back to that, nobody cares about that little poor dude from the hood. Or killing somebody who just on social media hollering and screaming. Don't nobody care about that. Now, if you got a loved one that's dying, 
people care about that because that's going to cost some money for that hospital to be able to, first of all, keep them alive, to at least try to keep them alive. It's going to cost some money. And then nobody wants to see anybody die. Nobody. Nobody. People are not that malicious. You know? I mean, we might say, okay, I hate this person. They're so racist. they that. But you ain't going to do nothing, you know, to them. I mean, you might. <laughs> But most people ain't going to do jack. They're going to talk to you a little bit. Try to get their point. They're going to beat the chest a lot. But they ain't going to do a whole lot. You know, there's a lot of talk and not much of anything else going on. So what I'm saying is that uh, all the conspiracy theories need to go out the window right now. Because this is serious. People are dying. There's a lot of uh, political stuff. People are still trying to win elections. So they want to make... Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, and Joe Biden look stupid because they're scared. They're scared that their guy who's in charge now is jacking up the planet. At least jacking the United States up. He's looking bad. So then all of a sudden this new propaganda comes out. You know, for the UN, uh, Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton. I said, hold on, none of these people are in power. The only one that can get in power is Joe Biden. So that's who they're really after, Joe Biden. You always know this stuff. Anytime somebody has something where it's an invisible bad person with no name that's hurting people, but then they assign a helper to that person, and that's their political opponent. Just know that you're being propagandized. <clears throat> because then they always point to somebody. Yeah, this is the Rothschilds, but they're supported by Hillary Clinton. And this is so-and-so, and they're supported by, this is the Taliban. They're supported by Barack Obama. They always connect some invisible bad person to an actual known opponent, a known adversary. That's called propaganda. That's how you know you're being propagandized. It's an MO to it. If you see something on the internet or on Facebook and it mentions a person by name specifically, this person caused this with no proof at all and there's the Illuminati did it, you know, some invisible group of people with no face. You can't go and knock on the Illuminati headquarters and speak to somebody. Then you know you're being propagandized right there. Because who, where is the Illuminati? Where's the headquarters at? Who's the, who's the uh, chief CEO of the Illuminati? You know, who's in charge of them? You know, <laughs> you know? but the Illuminati did it. And, uh, or the Akanakis, okay? First of all, okay, I know that there was a bunch of uh, cults in ancient days, different cults going on. But, you know, and the people write these books and they put them out there and then people go buy the book. And they swear by this little book they read that, you know, it's an Akanaki. Well, some dude made that junk up, Mike. You know, some Aganakis or some Ozzy's Ozzy's or whatever they are. You know, half lizard and half, you know, human, whatever. Already starting to sound weird. So when you start hearing a half lizard, half human person walking around on Earth with some bull crap that came from another planet, Alpha Venturi or somewhere like that, and you ain't never seen that planet before or heard of that planet, Till you start talking to this individual and you start Googling some on Google search, there's a very good chance that somebody wrote an article on Google search, planted it out there like it's legit, then got another source, because that's what uh that's what uh uh Breitbart does. Breitbart group is a white supremacist group. They go and they put it in one place, this fake white supremacy propaganda. Then they put it in several other places that got names that almost sound legit. This junk is just a made up racist conjecture propaganda <clears throat> to serve the purpose of demonizing somebody that's one of their opponents. That's what the purpose of it is. Ultimately, at the end of the day, when you get a person with power who's getting demonized, Know that you are experiencing propaganda. That's what that is. That is called propaganda. 
That is not factual. And just because you found it on Google, you're not researching anything. Google is not research. Google is just a way to get certain information quickly. But at some point, you got to have some common sense. And then after you had that common sense, you got to actually go out and go get some factual ground information to back up whatever it is, especially if you're going to go out with coronavirus and people are actually making, I saw people walking down the street with no mask on, no nothing, getting coronavirus. <laughs> I mean, I'm in my car just going to get some art supplies. I got my mask on. I have my, uh, <laughs> I got my gloves on. I got some disinfectant in my truck. And this person's just right out there and the person <coughs> coughing right beside him, all over the person, all over the place. And they just laughing and laying back. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I mean, they're kind of at the bus stop kind of scenario. And I'm like, this is, you know, they're gonna get on the bus now. He's gonna spread this all over the bus with nothing on. And then everybody on that bus, most likely everybody, has got the coronavirus by now. I'm talking right here in my own hometown. You know, just getting on the bus. <laughs> because people say, oh man, this, this ain't, this is not real. This is not real. This is, uh, and uh, certain, certain times you don't want people coming in. Well, you, when you're doing this stuff online, you don't want noise getting into your, your, into your microphone. You don't want noise getting into your microphone. So therefore, that's what you don't want to happen. So uh, anyway, a uh, whole lot of kind of uh, talk like that's going on. And what happens is it makes these people feel like ain't nothing happening. So they'll get on the bus and they're laughing at everybody else. I mean, literally laughing at the other person at the bus stop that does have the mask on, that do have the gloves, that do have everything on. They do. They do have everything on. And uh, so therefore, uh, so it's very, very not cool. You know, because those people are getting exposed and the person who's laughing is the one who's going to wind up actually getting the exposure. They're going to get exposed and they're going to be in ICU because then you look at the person and say, that person looks about 50 years old. That person right there looks 60. That person right there look 65, 70, you know? They're poor people. They're not necessarily seeming like the most educated people. But... I can see them on the first wave out. If this thing gets bad, they're the first ones that's going out, man. They're the first ones going out. And that's just not a cool thing. It's just not. It's just not a cool thing at all, you know? So uh, be careful of the... Nowadays, it's okay, like, when there's no pandemic to go on, have all your internet, social media propaganda going. You know, the Illuminati's doing this, and this is doing that, and Joe Biden's doing this, and Barack Obama's doing that. But when you have something going on where people are trying to save people's lives, literally, and when you have a certain person who is not saving anybody's life, who's just literally... Uh, that person need to get out of power fast. And somebody need to get in there that's qualified to do things right. Now, what I'm doing with this guy is I'm just using this fan brush to kind of add a little wispiness to the clouds. Now that I put the colors kind of sort of where I want to. And then I'm just going to tap it in in certain places. Kind of make them puff a little bit.
just a matter of sometimes whispering it and sometimes pumping it until they look good. Every once in a while, I might hit down a little bit on my palette, get pick up a little bit more color, especially if it's not whispering the way I want. Sometimes it's, I didn't put as much down as I thought. And just kind of create that uh, create that look that I want. Sometimes I do will use my finger as well. So that I dip straight from the palette. I'm using a fan brush for this part. Because I really want the I really want it to be soft. Soft, really nice, wispy brush strokes in these clouds. Just give the clouds a little bit more attitude than they have. They were okay clouds before. Now these clouds got a whole lot more attitude in them. It's got a whole lot more attitude. Taking a little bit of titanium white. Just bursting it in here and there, just to add a little bit of accent color here and there. In the clouds, randomly, letting a little bit of light show underneath, underneath it from different colors like yellow. And then what I'm doing is just take a little slight blend like that, boom, that's it. Cloud making 101 right here. Real easy, real fun, real simple. At least that side of the clouds, anyway. There we go. So I'm going to back off from that and see how that looks. And I like, well, I don't know, I kind of like the clouds better the way it was. Well, also, you know, when you're doing clouds, another thing that's as much as powerful as the brush, and this is why I like to have a base coat underneath, you go in with your towel. And you can subtract color too. And you can paint in reverse. So when I went back, it looked like it was a little bit too much. The clouds just wasn't as gentle in certain spots as I want them. So what I'm doing basically is I'm using this rag in my, kind of like a little bit of my finger. And I'm just kind of like, uh, modeling the cloud a little bit and wiping it up somewhat and leaving it somewhat. And again, this is a transparent layer over another layer. So you don't even know which layer is going to be the ultimate. You don't know what layer is actually making a color because it's layer underneath the layer on top of a layer underneath the layer. Okay, let's see what that's doing. Is that getting in? Oh yeah, that's better. That's starting to look better. I think I need to dip down right in here a little bit. As a matter of fact, not only that, I need to load up with just a little bit more titanium white right here. And a little bit of cadmium yellow light. Hit it right in there. And then whisk that on back and forward there. See what that does. Making my nice little evening sky here. Now I could paint this very meticulously, but I don't want to. I want to paint it very loose and natural and organically.